My name is Beth Rudy. Um, you have seen me once a day the entirety of this I Annotate conference, but I will introduce myself again for all of the new faces in the crowd. I run something called Science in the Classroom at AAAS. This, as a caveat, is not Science Magazine. I'm not involved in the science family of journals. What we do is annotate papers from the science family of journals and soon papers from outside the science family of journals for educational purposes um, so that non-experts or amateurs, if you, if you would like to call them amateurs, um, can access this uh, material a little bit more easily. Um, I was thinking about this sitting listening to our first panel which was an amazing kind of broad strokes blue sky discussion and realized that my discussion, and I don't know about the rest of my esteemed panelists, is very much looking at the forest and the trees, and in fact, maybe focusing on the trees. I don't know if that's really what Heather had had in mind for us, but <laughs> that's what I'm talking about now, is our workflow um, and how annotation uh, through an actual annotation software has helped us. So the vision for science in the classroom is relatively simple. We want to make real research accessible to non-experts slash amateurs um, and thereby enhance scientific literacy, hopefully. Um, we use annotation as a tool to highlight the collaborative nature of research. So a lot of people think that the scientific method is a thing that actually happens in a linear fashion. Um, anybody who has done science knows that that is not, in fact, the case. And what it is is just kind of a collaborative effort across many years and many subjects, um, revising and uh, iterating um, our knowledge. And finally, we want to empower educators. So there are a lot of educators out there that would like to speak about science, they'd like to speak about real research, but they also feel incredibly intimidated um, because as was mentioned in the uh, first panel, Scientific papers are really difficult to consume, um, and it's kind of a barrier for the rest of, of the world. As an overview of what Science in the Classroom has to offer, we currently have 84 published papers. We have 14 in our queue. Um, we have 90 and counting contributors. Uh, those are ranging from actual high school students to grad students to postdocs to uh, educators and research. Um, research people who actually aren't um, very skilled necessarily when they start the process of uh, communicating their science to an undergraduate level. By the time that we're done, we're hoping that they feel a lot more comfortable with it. Um, each article comes with the unaltered article. We think it's really important to present the information as it was originally presented. Um, but it has an interactive annotation fabric um, that is woven over the top of it. Um, we also have tabs for all of the figures in the paper. And those tabs are used to kind of describe the methodology, visualization, et cetera, um, that the authors decided to use in order to convey their information. We supply educators with educator guides. Um, a lot of our resources have data activities that allow students to actually get their hands, quote unquote, dirty um, and, and play with the data a little bit. News and policy and external resources. And finally, in our new website, we also have the ability to create collections. So that's external resources, news and policy, and uh, multiple annotated papers in one subject. Here's what our past process of our workflow looked like. We would ask an annotator to take an article. Uh, this is a PDF version of the article. And we would ask them to use the Adobe commenting tools um, in order to annotate it for us. So. Um, as you can see, the, the highlights have different colors. We asked them to use those different colors to indicate which learning lens um, they wanted to categorize those annotations in. Um, and then you can see kind of from all of the little uh, bubbles up there, each one of those has a comment on it. And those comments are the annotations that they wanted to put um, on the paper. And then we used a lot of um, copy paste, it was really fun to put each one of the individual annotations <laughs> directly onto the text using a Drupal 7 widget. So we had to uh, highlight the text that we wanted to annotate, copy paste from the Adobe file over into the um, Drupal widget, and then that would put an HTML layer on top of it. Um, and then this is our old website, which we never told anybody to go to after uh, starting about a year ago, because it was kind of embarrassing. It looked like we'd made it in 1995. Um, looks a little better now. Once we started partnering with Hypothesis, um, we were uh, still in like kind of the learning process. We're still in the learning process now. Um, 
we either gave annotators the login for the actual administrator account so that they could go in and uh, write the annotations within that account, or they developed their own hypothesis login, and then we had to go in and copy and paste all of the different <laughs> annotations and put them back in under the uh, SITSI administrator account in order to get the learning lens, which is how we, um, how we provide our annotations to the users to uh, import them. Um, and then now, thankfully, working very closely with John. John, where are you? John? John Udell, are you there? That's so sad. He is our savior. Um, and now we have uh, a situation where, as you can see, the annotator in this experience, they, uh, their, their title is Beyond Roots. It's not the administrator account. It's their own annotation account. Um, and we have it set up so that now all we have to do is uh, kind of deploy, um, push a, a deploy on our, our end, on the Drupal 8 end, and it will um, start bringing the annotations in through our learning lens. So our overall needs um, as a product, I hate referring to something that has educational value as a product, but it's, it's the easiest way to refer to it. Um, we need editorial control over our annotations. Um, so a lot of times it's a good idea to let people annotate um, as freely as they possibly would like, um, because we're actually providing educational content that is uh, an, a layer of expertise um, put on top of our papers, we need to have that editorial control. So if somebody says, hey, that's not correct, or uh, this annotation is written for like somebody who's a, a tenured professor instead of uh, an undergraduate, we need to be able to go in and change it. We need a streamlined annotation process. Um, so as you can see, there's been a whole lot of um, copy-paste going on in our lives. And I would ideally like there to be no more copy-paste ever. In fact, I'd like to light fire to copying, pasting, um, and never do it again. Another problem that we have with our annotation process is that there are frequent breaks. Um, and so any time that there is an annotation uh, flub going on where we can't get our information uh, provided to the people who are using it. Um, this is a problem. We end up having an email chain of like 500 to 600 emails, it seems, sometimes um, to, to troubleshoot. Um, eventually, um, and I know we're not there yet, but eventually I'd also like to set fire to those email chains. Um, we also need something that's hardy, meaning it's really difficult to break it. Um, and we need something that's flexible. So ideally, at some point, we would like to be able to let um, let there be a learning lens that's just user-generated content. Um, so that's more students coming on, reading, asking questions, interacting with the authors, annotators interacting with other annotators, um, that type of thing. Um, and then being able to turn on different learning lenses based on what paper the person's looking at um, or what's relevant for that particular content. Issues that we've had um, so far, we have a lot of learning lens breakage um, with the hypothesis integration. We found all sorts of really cool ways to break it. I'm sure we'll find more ways as we go. Um, so if there's a reply on any of the um, annotations, it breaks the whole thing. Uh, if there's an orphan annotation, it breaks the whole thing. If there's a page note, it breaks the whole thing. So we're working on that. Um, <laughs> the learning lens presentation, um, because we have this proprietary software that, that delivers content in a very uh, beautiful and accessible way um, to our users, um, it also is stuck with a specific sized block that pops up when you're, when you're clicking on the annotations. And what that means is that the lovely hypothesis automated integration of images and videos um, doesn't convey nearly as well with our own learning lens. So that's something that we need to work with our developers to get that looking a little bit better. Um, and then one of the things that uh, Shelby Lake is the program associate um, for Science in the Classroom, and he and I are always sad at how much we totally rely on others um, to be able to do our job. Um, I feel terrible every single time I bug John, um, and I feel terrible every single time that I bug our uh, Drupal developers. Um, and I realize that working with them is in fact part of our job, but eventually it's at, at some point we would really like to have that control so that we don't have to rely on the developers to deploy a change to the website in order to get the annotations to be pulled in automatically. Um, poor John has been awesome and has made us a custom um, hypothesis Chrome extension just for us um, so that we can do kind of a few things to make our workflow better. Um, but that's really not sustainable for him um, or for us in the long run. Um, and so at some point, we'd really like to be able to, to walk around on our, our own two feet. Um, and it sounds kind of like 
where Hypothesis is going, where other annotation clients are going is very much in that way. Um, I will leave it at that. And next up we have Sebastian Kircher. And you are the associate director, correct? Of qualitative data repository. Let me see if I can pull up your paper. There we go. Good morning and thank you. Uh, yeah, continuing on the uh, tree theme topic. This is again very hands-on and I don't know, hopefully a little vision, but low on the vision probably. Uh, so uh, qualitative data repository, we are a small social science data repository. Uh, we archive qualitative uh, social science data and um, anyone who is in the sciences more broadly or reads about the sciences has probably followed along with what many people call the transparency revolution uh, in the sciences. The expectation today is that if you publish empirical science, you are transparent about um, the, what's behind the science that you publish, and that includes uh, publishing uh, your data and how you analyze your data. And Broadly speaking, with some caveats, um, we know how to do this with quantitative data. Um, not everyone does it, by all means, but we know how it should be done, right? So you have some type of uh, matrix form uh, data, spreadsheet, uh, columns, rows. Uh, then you have uh, some code in a uh, language that analyzes that data. It could be R, it could be Python, it could be Stata, it could be something more fancy. Um, and that code produces a table, or if you're cool, it produces a figure. Um, and then you put the code and the spreadsheet, the matrix, in a data repository, and boom, you have transparency, and it's great. That's not how qualitative research usually works. When you do qualitative research in the social sciences, oftentimes you have, you know, you write a sentence and then that you point to maybe one or two documents that might be an interview, that might be a archival source, and then you discuss how you analyze that, and then you move on in your story, and you point to the next document, you go through the process again, and you do that again and again and again, and you do that in like, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 different passages in your text, so your nice kind of data set script, put it in a repository, uh, doesn't really work that neatly. There is a traditional way scholars have dealt with that for, there's some debate about this, but roughly the, since the end of the 16th century, um, and that's the beloved footnote, or in this more horrifying example, an endnote, no one likes endnotes. Um, and so the idea is uh, pretty similar, right? So you write something and then you put a footnote in there and then uh, you um, write a little bit about what that footnote does and you point to the sources that you use. And if you look at that footnote, two ex problems, uh, or endnote in this case, two problems come immediately to mind. The first problem is, uh, the two sources, if you can see them, I don't know how large this is. Yeah, they're kind of uh, viewable. There are uh, books published in Russia in, or the Soviet Union in the 1920s. There, I don't think in any US library. Uh, so kind of hard for you to find those. Um, and you're also, given that it's printed, uh, your editor will not be very happy if you go into great length in your endnotes. There was this time when people published, you know, three quarters of their pages as footnotes in history. At least in the social sciences, no journal editor uh, will let you get through with that. So both not good for transparency. You can't actually go to the underlying data unless you travel to all the places the researcher traveled to. I'm a comparative politist text scholar, I travel a lot, so that's usually not feasible, and you have space constraints. Not good. Uh, with annotations, we think we can get around a lot of this. Um, so instead of having a footnote, we just put an annotation um, over the relevant passage in the article, and then the author has as much space as they want to 
talk about, you know, why did I use this source? What is this source doing? What's the level of credibility of this source, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's all digital, so space constraints, not really an issue. Um, and I can then link to a primary source uh, that I've digitized and put into our data repository. And uh, a reader, instead of traveling to uh, Moscow, can just click through and look at the link. The cool thing is this is not a vision. This is very much uh, a practice. So QR code uh, uh, URL if you want to try this out. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to let you play with this a little bit. Uh, I, I should warn you, sh you will need to register for the repository to actually click through the source. There are a couple of sociological, uh, not technical actually, uh, reasons for that, but otherwise, I think it looks really fun and uh, it adds a lot of depth uh, to the article. Vision. We were supposed to talk about vision, so, so this is a shorter term vision, but some of the things, we started uh, working on this about a year ago and we're very proud that we actually have something tangible up in uh, such a short amount of time and a lot of credit for that goes to hypothesis for providing the annotation infrastructure that works nicely with that. The biggest kind of issue for us is that this is still very tedious for the scholars to actually do. So a lot of what we're thinking about is how can we integrate writing these annotations into the process in which the scholars create their work rather than having them do this at the end when they may have forgotten all about um, the research they've done, and uh, one of the principal ways that we're thinking about this is integrating this with the tools that the scholars use to um, store and annotate their research, be it reference managers, be it uh, qualitative analysis tools that's in vivo there, or be it for the more adventurous qualitative scholars tools uh, like GitHub or the Open Science Framework or both of them. The second one, and that's obvious for who we are, is uh, preserve and protect those annotations. We are a data repository. That's kind of the core of our mission is that the stuff is going to be there and accessible not in five years but in 50 years. Uh, and that has a lot of challenges, especially when you think about these kind of two moving targets that we have to deal with with annotations, which is A, the annotation and B, the underlying uh, publication, uh, where especially when we work with hypothesis and with a publisher, we don't really have control about uh, of, over either of them, so that's a bit tricky for us. Uh, and then, at least as, as, as an idea that we want to explore, social is maybe a little strong, but obviously this is a very interesting way to do interactive source criticism, right? So your researcher makes a point about, you know, I've consulted this source and this says X, and then this is a great place to reply, well, no, I've, I've seen this source, I've looked it up, and, and no, it doesn't. Um, and this debate is taking place in social science currently, but it's very isolated because um, the only people who can engage in the debate have, are the people who went to the same archive. So, so it's very narrow, and we think that this can expand this. Obviously, there is all of the kind of considerations that we talked about yesterday with you know, comment systems are very risky places and academics, in spite of what those of you who aren't in academia might think, are not actually very nice people all the time. Uh, so um, there needs to be a lot of kind of safeguards in place to make sure this happens in a constructive way. Okay, we were also supposed to talk about creating a better ecosystem, and that's where I get to scold people, and to compensate for this, they're gonna be cute animal pictures. Um, <laughs> creating a better ecosystem. So we encountered a bunch of problems with this that we didn't really expect, and I just figured I would showcase some of these. One of the bigger ones is if you embed a PDF in an HTML frame, I cannot annotate it. Please don't do it. And this is kind of the old uh, Wiley layout, and, um, but a, a lot of the kind of cool new kids on the preprint front, the Zenodos and the OSF framework, do this too, and it's not nice. Please don't do it. Cone of shame. <laughs> Even worse is read cube. I, I'm just going to leave it at that because, you know, lock it up in a proprietary system, uh, 
make it impossible to annotate with ex anything except the Readcube annotation tool, and look how angry that guy is. Um, <laughs> This is actually not Elsevier's fault, um, although I put up the Elsevier example, but it's an obstacle that I wanted to raise. Um, if we want to link to an article, a lot of the time that goes, of course, through the hypothesis proxy, which breaks the authentication uh, to uh, paywalled articles, which is really unfortunate because a lot of the people we want to read this may not have the hypothesis Chrome extension installed. Um, so this is, in this case, not a blaming uh, the publisher necessarily, except for you know, not being open access, um, but a problem that we uh, need to solve or look very sad. Um, the last thing is um, two things ac actually, and these are begging for better metadata. Uh, one thing is that good metadata on article pages helps us um, solve tying the annotations to the right page. And so these three meta tags are the entirety of the meta tag on, on one article page, and that's not terribly helpful. Um, the other thing is that session-specific cryptic PDF URLs are horrible if I want to point an, uh, a reader to a PDF and say, look at that annotated version of the PDF, and I can't do it because the PDF is session has a session-specific URL uh, that's sad, so please don't do it. And this is how I'm looking at you. Okay. Thanks. I think uh, sad and happy dogs make everything better, so that was a good call. Um, next, we have somebody that you have already met, but I will reintroduce her, Jennifer Lin. Uh, she is the director of product management at Crossref, something that I love very much. Cool. I don't use Macs anymore on purpose. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. <laughs> All right. Um, as Beth mentioned, I'm Jennifer Lynn. And I'm speaking here about Crossref. And <laughs> the, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, the organization, we provide scholarly infrastructure. Um, there are digital object identifiers that are a big part of what we do, which prevents link rot, essentially, from happening with scholarly um, research uh, that, are, that have been published. Um, we do a lot of other things, and um, some of which I'll cover over the course of talking about actual annotations and why all of this matters. So a big part of what we do is the um, connecting up, the linking up of, um, of many things through metadata. And um, this is not only um, research articles, two research articles through, say, references, but um, even with metadata within a specific research work, such as the contributor through an ORCID, thank you, Rob, um, to the funder with a unique funder ID through a funder registry to the research article, to the data set, through the software, et cetera. Um, but all of that linking up is enabled through metadata. We're here because of annotations, and you know, annotations are, I think we can all agree, um, a, a very valuable asset that can enrich the research findings that are shared, whether or not that um, finding is represented in the form of a research paper, or a preprint, or a data set, or even software. Annotations are a um, scholarly resource, and um, we need to figure out, together as a community, how we properly treat it as such. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is getting it into the scholarly record for what reasons, um, so that people can find it, so that the researchers can cite it, and that the annotators who are contributing, who are knowledge producers, can get credit for it, um, so that it can get linked up into um, the larger map of research, um, research production, and so that it can be discovered, whether it's because it can be text and data mined, or, um, and then linked up to the article, which, is, which then is also text and data mined. All those things um, that are associated with the annotation um, are ways and inlets to finding um, the research, answering the research questions that, that, that we have. So I think the, the point is that we need to be, that researchers um, have the potential to be annotating along the way. And that it's not just the publication workflow, right, but the entire workflow of the researcher conducting his or her work. 
um, it, that might start off at the level of the grant, right? If the grant is published, it can then be annotated, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I know that many funders, um, by law perhaps, are, are um, required to publish the grants. Private philanthropies are also beginning to move in this direction. I think this, um, these, these um, initial proposals um, can be very, very useful, not only to the funder as well as the research group involved, but the larger community. Annotations then would enrich that. The, soft, the software and the data sets that go into, um, that are output um, of the research itself, you know, these, are obvious to us all, but all the way down from the early outputs that are shared or perhaps shared within a small circle and kept private, um, all the way down to the final publication, as well as all of the different reuse objects that come out of the, these publications, all of them can be annotated and all of these can, um, are, are then you know, important um, enrichments which we, we all need to know about. So getting this into the scholarly record by way of the metadata is the way, um, is the mechanism by which at Crossref we understand we can help out. This diagram is very, very unuseful in the sense that um, it, 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 it's um, article centric and that's not at all what we mean to say so much as to illustrate that there are things that link up and things, these things that count traditionally um, are only a subset of the thing, other things that could count and may count if we properly support it as part of the formal scholarly record. So you have the article that's connected to other articles. We have the data and software that underlie the research findings in that article, the preprints, the videos, the protocols, the published peer reviews. Um, we also have, of course, the annotations here. And by linking all of this up, we can create what is a, essentially a massive graph or an, um, a map of research in itself. And at Crossref, you know, because we're open scholarly infrastructure, we make all of this freely available through our APIs to the entire community. Um, this map then is able to link up the research works to the contributors, whether you're a contributor of, um, as a research the authors um, or the editor or the reviewer or say the author of the annotation or the curator of the data set, et cetera, to then also the activity surrounding it. And um, this is one of the things that we have been working on for two years to build. And beta is actually going to start in a couple of weeks. It's called Crossref Event Data, where we're going to be um, collecting activity of events, what we call events, surrounding these research publications and then knitting it up into this open scholarly map so that any um, of the links between social media and, say, a book or a data set um, that's been registered with DataCite or a research article, et cetera, can then um, be linked up to all the other things that, say, the research article is also linked up to. Um, references and mentions in Wikipedia, you know, um, mentions and blog posts. Um, what this will include when we um, release the beta is also hypothesis annotations that occur on any, um, any publications that have been registered with Crossref and DataCite. So anything that has a DOI um, with an hypothesis an annotation, we are going to be making available through our API. So we hope that this will be a useful thing um, for everyone as we begin to figure out, you know, what can we do with all of these links? What can we do with this open scholarly map? Um, so again, it's not just the publication workflow itself that's important, it's the entire research workflow all the way down. And with this open data, as I mentioned, you know, we, um, the, the, the use cases of it are unlimited. Um, how people interpret it is wide open. What we do is just make the data openly available to everyone. Um, so I think um, I'll echo a point that Sebastian made earlier in terms of um, what we need is um, we need all players online to play well um, and make <laughs> um, the content um, 
available in a way where systems, robots, um, APIs, et cetera, can find it. Mm -hmm. um, how you set it up, there are very many ways. Um, some publishers or some platforms have set it up so there's lots of cookies which block you. Um, there are ways in which you can have so many URL redirects that that also becomes a challenge. Um, I, I won't go too much into it, but um, please don't do any of those things. Make it easier <laughs> for all of the systems who are trying to knit everything together and um, propagate this to everyone. M make, please make it easy for hypothesis to know about um, the, the annotations that may they may happen um, surrounding your your platforms on your platforms and also one last thing is that to the extent that yes absolutely one one last thing is that um, you know as, as infrastructure provider we want to make sure that we are supporting everyone so um, in the event that you have a platform that you would also like um, to be included in event data there are links there are events there's activities surrounding research publications that are happening on your platform please do talk to me we would like to include you in the crosswalk event data tracker thank you thank you so much that was awesome While we're trying to get um, Joel on the screen for all of us, um, you may have already actually figured this out, Jennifer. Sound check one, two, three, uh, one, two, like, three. How are you going to assign DOIs to the annotations, or are you going to assign actual DOIs to the annotations themselves? Sound check one, two, three. Woo! I think Joel's here. <laughs> Sound check one, two, three. Sound check one, two, three. We hear you. Ready to roll? Cool. No worries. No worries. Just a quick answer. Yeah. Uh, what, I think this has been shut off. So it doesn't matter. Is it? No, it's on. Okay. Yeah, please go. Okay. I'll answer the question really quickly. Um, the crossover event data actually tracks activity surrounding research publications with a DOI. It itself does not need a DOI. Cool. Right, so a tweet um, about a research article will be part, uh, will be an event that we share. A tweet does not need a DOI, mm -hmm. we're capturing it. That's great. That makes things easier. Now I would like to introduce Joel Plotkin. He is the CEO of uh, eJournals Press. He is joining us remotely. Can you see Hello, everybody. Can he see us? Yep, yep. Excellent. You can hear me okay? Yes. We should be good to go. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for taking a few minutes to listen to our presentations. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is how we use the hypothesis annotation tool in the classical peer review process and the uh, slide presentation in five minutes. And basically, so the use case that we're trying to address is that uh, journals around the world use a basic uh, online web based peer review software. And traditionally, editors invite reviewers to review the manuscripts, and reviewers provide reviews or feedback via web forms. And the web forms are based on a series of questions. They ask about the scientific merit, is a science novel, yes, no type questions. And um, so the question that we were working with Hypothesis, eLife, and American Geophysical Union was, is how can we use annotation tools to help authors and re reviewers and editors redline the documents and collaborate a little better? Um, here's a sample of the web-based web uh, forms that asking the questions and comments to author or comments to editor. And um, if, if the audience has been a part of the peer review process, they're very probably familiar with this. So what we did is we started looking at the hypothesis tool and we wanted to make it so that the reviewers and editors could mark up the PDF article file. We also realized that we wanted to share this marked up manuscript with the authors, but we didn't. We need to still be able to blind who the reviewers are, so the authors could see, oh, it's reviewer number one, reviewer number two's comments or annotations, but the editors should see that it's both reviewer number one and that that person is John Smith or Sally Waters per se. So there's different security models that we'll show you today. And then also, as you start making annotations, we um, got feedback from. American Geophysical Union, it'd be nice to uh, 
tag these annotations, whether they're major or minor concerns, whether they're just small edits, whether they're related to figures, et cetera. And then as you go through and start using the annotation or hypothesis tool, there starts to be a lot of comments or annotations. So it'd be nice to have a filtering system where you say, show me only the major concerns or show me only the concerns regarding figures or show me only the concerns regarding this reviewer's, uh, reviewer number one's comments. And um, I'm gonna show you some, what we ended up coming up with on the next set of screens. So within our peer review system, you'll see that there'll be a link to annotate the merge PDF and also show a summary table. We'll come back to that in a second. But when you click on the annotate link, we'll actually display the hypothesis um, annotation tool and you'll be able to highlight a specific set of text in the tool. Um, this is as if you were a reviewer and you wanted to mark up this manuscript. You can click on this annotate button after you highlight it. And then a comments area, will, the classical hypothesis comments area will be displayed and you can type in your comment and on the, after, underneath the comment you can tag it whether it's just a summary, major, minor, edit, and all that's configurable. And you can also specify whether this is a confidential comment just to display to the editors or whether these annotations should display to the authors also. And then in um, the hypothesis tool, we've configured it to be able to display the annotations on the side panel. And as you can see, we'll show you the role of each person, reviewer number one, reviewer number two. And this is in the editor um, security model, so you actually see the full, full name of who's commenting. But if, if it was, this was being used by the author, it would just see the tag, reviewer number one, but not their full name. Here you can see that there's a whole list of annotations that are going on with the different tags and so forth. And as I was saying earlier, sometimes that list becomes very long, so you want a way of filtering. You can click on the all annotations link at the top and select a various filter. Just show me your number one's comments, show me the major comments, show me the edits, and so forth. The next thing is we had to work on the user interface because even though we're gathering all this data, we sort of had to meld it back to the classical peer review form that I showed you traditionally with all the questions and comments. And so what we did is we decoupled the hypothesis user interface from, our, from their classical backend database. And all those annotations that, that the reviewers are putting into the hypothesis toolkit are actually going back to EGL Press database uh, for this one manuscript. And then we can repurpose the annotation however we want it. So we go back, we store the database, then later on we actually um, query our database and we can build a nice web-based form that will summarize the annotations. It will give them the context of where the annotation highlighted, what the reviewer's comments were, what the categories were, whether there was a confidential comment or not. And this is very important because we need to find a clean way to say, well, if the person doesn't want to click on that annotations link, how can we still show the author a summary of this feedback in the decision letter? And so we build this web form and then we actually can convert it on the fly to a PDF file and attach this PDF file, um, this summary to the author decision letter. So the author can quickly see what the comments were and try to revise their manuscript. They'll also have the option to go back and actually interact with the tool if they want, but we wanted to give authors um, both ways of interacting with the system. And that's the presentation for today. Uh, questions? Uh, let me see. Awesome, thanks. Great. Uh, questions? Can anybody hear me through this? Not really. And if you do, come over here. Hi, I have a question, um, uh, and this is in regarding to. Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Yeah, is no, there any questions or not? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm Gail Clement. I'm a library administrator at Caltech. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of AGU authors, editors, and I myself was on the AGU pubs committee for a couple of years. Um, I am really wondering what your expectation or your hopes are for who's now training researchers for these additional tools and practices around annotation. Um, that's part A. 
And then the loaded part of this is uh, part B would be, and is there a role for libraries in particular who are training authors on a whole bunch of other stuff around open scholarly uh, stuff uh, that our training could be supported, that what we're doing uh, to train researchers on our campuses could be integrated into the way that you're pushing out these tools as part of the research uh, life cycle, as part of the researcher workflow? Okay, I'll try to answer the three topics. So um, right now we're doing a pilot with American Geophysical Union because it's not just for new authors or new reviewers and authors, but it's, it's even people who've been publishing 20 or 30 years or working, you know, helping journals peer review for many a long time. This whole annotation process can be very new to them. So what we figure um, is to do this pilot, gain the feedback, and then we'll probably set up some web videos to show them how to use the tools, best practices. Um, you know, also at scholarly, you know, conferences like Society of Scholarly Publishing or Council of Science Editors, we'll also be able to do presentations and educate people how to use the tools. Um, yeah, so my view on this is that I would like technologies to require as little training as possible. Uh, researchers are very busy. They don't like to spend time on being trained. And so my first step is always try to do this with steps or in ways that they already know uh, rather than require training. To the extent that training is required or at least helpful, I think libraries are a great place. It's often the place where kind of new scholarly technologies are getting introduced to researchers because the other place are the senior faculty and they usually use the tools that are 20 years old. So, so in that sense, uh, if, to the extent that training is needed, I think libraries have a key role to play. I think it is a very interesting question, you know, from a, I, I build products, product director, from that standpoint, obviously you want to design the system in so much as it can as easily be integrated into workflows as possible. User experience is a big thing. User design is another big thing. But we also know the same problem exists on the other side, which is, there isn't any such thing as the build it and they will come bit, right? So to the extent that there are new social ways of sharing and communicating that need to be then um, built into the system, I, I, that may go above and beyond than merely just delivering a product that can easily be, uh, be used. I think that's a really good point in that we've got all of these great tools out there and people don't necessarily know that they exist. Um, so it's not just training people how to use it, it's how do you even make it known that it's available. Um, and that's an interesting question. Heather. I just wanted to add on that that we're going to have unconferencing sessions this afternoon and one that we hope you'll be interested in joining is adoption strategies. So uh, if you are interested in this topic, and I think every use case we've heard and we'll, we'll hear later today has the adoption strategy aspect to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm putting out a plug for that. It's not on the wall yet, but it will be. Cool. Hi. So the sci-fi conference already has been having, um, for its proceedings, has been having annotations via GitHub uh, tags and uh, markup in that way, uh, as it was mentioned yesterday, being able to go to a specific line is extremely helpful. Um, I've been, I'm somewhat in charge of making hypothesis a thing as part of that process, but I'm somewhat afraid of the difficulty of integrating with the existing GitHub annotation mm -hmm. services. Um, particularly, this is super useful for reviews um, mm -hmm. because it's specifically about papers. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any efforts right now to integrate across these uh, different platforms for annotating, including things that are, say, internal or proprietary, like GitHub? Mm -hmm. That may be one of those questions that's actually better for the hypothesis team than for us, but I could be completely wrong about that. Um, what did you Other services would be fine, too. Yeah, sure. What, what did you say the conference was? Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, the scientific uh, uh, scientific, com scientific Computing and Python Conference. Ah, Scientific Computing and Python Conference. So Joel, can you hear me talking right now? Joel, can you hear me? I, did we mute him? Oh, okay. Cool. Well, that's okay. We can't hear him, but he can hear us. So, so to sort of sum up, 
Um, <laughs> ah, there we go. The question was, um, how are we approaching integration of multiple different platforms that are kind of trying to do the same thing? Um, because I hadn't realized until yesterday that GitHub already had like an annotation process and was way ahead of the curve um, when it came to that. Um, and so, Joel, you may not be able to answer that question. That may be a question for um, the Hypothesis team and the people who are working on the annotating software. Um, I certainly don't have a good answer to that. Uh, I, I think in general, this is sort of like a, a, a new field. And, um, you know, people are looking at different ways to use Hypothesis. And I think it will continue to evolve. But um, I think people like Dan and Hypothesis are reaching out to different vendors and sharing their ideas, even as far as standard annotation formats and tools and so forth. And I think over the course of the next couple of years, there'll be a, a convergence on the ways and the techniques of using annotations. But um, there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve and time to get there. Both the tool set and, as a previous question answered, how do we train the end users and so forth? As a follow up, uh, or somewhat related, uh, in terms of uh, code and software as actually part of the research process, uh, there's uh, that Don Ho quote that the real uh, work of science is not what is in the paper, it's just the uh, advertisement for the real work of the science right. and recording all of that. And so, uh, what efforts are being done right now to really get that connection mm -hmm. between having not just papers being annotated, but the entire research process? Right. Okay, so to sum up that, Joel, did you hear that at all? Uh, can you repeat one more time? Absolutely. Um, and I think this is a really good and interesting question and something that my, my uh, science in the classroom is really interested in. Not just annotating the paper that comes out of the research, but how are we going to be helping use annotation to talk about the research process itself? Um, and so you've got this paper, you've got these great things, they're publishing their results, but how can we use annotation to kind of weave into that? How were those results acquired in the first place and what's the actual practice and nature of science um, or any research? Okay, that, that's actually pretty neat because there's some journals that are very classical, they have these reviews, and I think of annotations as another way of getting feedback from their viewers and editors to the author so they can improve their communications and so forth, whether it's about the piece of science. But um, someone who's a little more innovative, if you look at what eLife is doing, they're actually publishing the reviews. So um, they'll, you know, they're they'll work with the author, there'll be comments or annotations going back and forth. And when the manuscript finally gets published, they'll actually publish the reviews with the annotations downstream so readers can understand what type of dialogue existed between the author, the reviewers, and the editors to understand uh, what their concerns might have been, how the manuscript was refined. So classically, reviews and at a, a more specific level, annotations were kept very private. And I think in the future, some journals will share will share more of that information. And by sharing the views and the annotations, it will help um, scientific conversation about the topic. So I would, I don't know if this is sacrilegious. I don't think uh, the answer to every problem in science needs to be annotation. I, I think the problem of better annotating data and code into papers is uh, your t-shirt. Uh, right, so Jupyter Notebooks and our Markdown and related tools are much better suited for that purpose than trying to cram that into annotations. And to the extent you want to, you know, you can uh, annotate your R Markdown or your Jupyter uh, file. Uh, but but I think for linking linking the software to the paper, you use the tools that are designed for that, and they're really kind of terrific in that. Yeah, I agree with that. No, I think that that's a good. That's a good way of looking at that, the actual summing up of the software element of the research um, that went into producing the results. Use maybe something else. Um, for science in the classroom, we definitely use annotation in order to kind of uh, help guide the readers through how the whole research project was done, not just the software, but, but kind of all of it, and then how it relates back to the full body of work that was used to inform that question in the first place. Um, and then finally, how the information in that particular paper is then used to inform the community going forward. I guess one clarifying point here, um, the term annotations is a little bit vague. Um, so I think maybe using the loosest form of annotations, um, 
that I can see to be very valuable across the board. Whether or not it needs to take a specific format and use this specific technology is another question. But you know, gene annotations, that's been around since you know, we had the genetic code. So uh, that those annotations obviously look very different than say a, a hypothesis one. Does it need to is a good question. But um, yes, annotate, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got time for one more question. You are the lucky questioner. All right. Um, uh, Nick, I want to speak now as a researcher um, who, who's reviewed many articles and had many of my articles reviewed. Um, I just wanted to, to caution against getting stuck on the problem of having to train people to do annotation uh, and instead maybe focus the emphasis on um, how can all of you who are building amazing tools, uh, and I applaud you, how can you work together to make sure that you're not creating 17 different rather identical processes? Yep. Um, so as, no one trains anyone to do reviews. Uh, you learn how to do a review because someone asked you to do one and you start doing them. Uh, so I, I wouldn't worry so much about training people to do reviews. Your process is far more um, you know, in, intuitive than uh, something where you, you're, you're reading a whole paper and you're taking out sentences and pasting them into a Word document and then commenting about those and then trying to create a synthetic review from mm -hmm. everything. Um, annotations are, are far easier. Um, also, there's a huge thirst in the community for more of these annotations and something that's more like public review where we actually get credit for making a paper better by giving constructive comments mm -hmm. and annotations onto the paper. So I would just, I would caution you to like look to all the upside and focus on the upside mm -hmm. because the, uh, in the research community, we want the, the tools that you're building. Right now, our process is kind of optimized for the Pony Express. It's like, oh, we, well, you're gonna send a paper to an editor and they're gonna send it out to some other people and then they're gonna send it back and it's gonna take a year. And uh, for, a scientist, for a science to iterate quickly, um, we need something like the tools you're developing. So, so please know that we love it and focus on making the tools as similar as possible mm -hmm. so that when we do use them um, across different platforms, it's, it's easy for us to, to do the second, third, and fourth time. Uh, so Joel, just to sum up that, um, embrace the positive, try to uh, make platforms kind of similar across the board, don't reinvent the wheel, um, and keep going. And basically, from the research community standpoint, the product that the e-journals press and the rest of us are kind of haphazardly cobbling together um, is much easier than trying to copy-paste into a Word document and, and creating that kind of a review document. Um, does anybody have any closing questions? I thought that was a really great point to close on. So I will officially call an end to this, and I believe we now have a break. Thanks, guys. Thanks, panelists.